This video was sponsored by the Deck of Many and their new free campaign setting. More on that near the end of the video. So, one of my players used the wish spell. It all started six weeks ago in an online D&D campaign I've been running for around a year. Originally, the game was paid to play as finding consistent groups to play with online is pretty tough. Paying to join D&D sessions is still a bit of an iffy topic, so if you want my opinions on it, go ahead and watch this video. But regardless, after the first few months though, most of the original party was still enjoying themselves at the table. So I dropped the fee to play and we've been roleplaying twice a week ever since. For this particular group, we started at level 1 playing the Lost Minds of Fendelver module, a pre written campaign meant to bring your players up to level 5. The game was great, and by that I mean a complete bloodbath. The party was almost completely wiped out in the very second fight of the game, and if it wasn't for the warlock's fiendish patron, and the paladin selling his soul for ungodly amounts of power, that probably would have been the end of it. Now, because the party had made a few connections to devilish creatures already, by the time they finished the Fandelver module, it was a no-brainer as to which book I should pick up and run for them next. At the time, Wizards of the Coast had just released their newest module Descent into Avernus, which was chock full of dark creatures warring out in the first layer of hell. The best part about Descent into Avernus wasn't just the module, but also the rules regarding war machines and how to roleplay out devil deals. An important thing to note is that in exchange for your soul, devils can offer a variety of rewards to the seller. From land, magic items, all the way to wishes, there's really no limit to what a fiend could offer. The stronger the devil, the more they can give, so scouting out a high ranking fiend would be the key to getting the best rewards. Now half of the story was bold both talking to and murdering the denizens of hell, while also working to purify a corrupted angel. Somewhere in between was looking for a holy blade which the party needed to make dealing with the other two problems easier. The sword had so much magic stored up inside of it that when the party eventually found the blade, it turned most of them into half angels. Their bodies morphed to peak physical condition, blemishes and scars vanished, and their faces became perfect. Later on, the party returned the sword to its original owner. After getting re-angelified, the girl peaced out and the mission was complete, but for some of the players involved, it was a bit more complicated than that. Now, the group had finally just finished one of the longest quests I've ever ran in D&D history, and to celebrate, I gave the party two years worth of downtime to do whatever crazy nonsense they were interested in. Everyone could finally use the money they've been collecting to build houses, form relationships, and start up prospective businesses. For the Conquest Paladin, however, it was also a time to collect a debt that Fring the Angel had created. During his downtime, Ace the Paladin decided to rebuild a ruined village back near the sword's coast, seeing as the party had sort of destroyed it the last time they were there. He also found time to head back to Hell and discuss his payment for the job he had completed. I did your dirty work, Belle. The angel's gone. Now it's about time you repaid me. You're lucky this deal was written in blood. Take what I promised you and never return. We're done here. Once the years came to an end, the rogue had gotten rich off of his hitman career, our wizard now owned the best magical academy in the city of Neverwinter, the bard had proposed to his love, and Ace's village couldn't have been growing any better. The party could finally retire, and with their adventures over would be the end of our campaign. Haha, <laughs> just kidding. Our plan was to reach level 20 and beyond, so with the party being only level 14, we still had a ways to go. After their time off, the group was called in for an important meeting to discuss the end of the world. You know, high level character problems. The five factions capable of helping against the threat were at each other's throats, and only the party could reunite them before the epic final battle to come. Alright, end of the world, human enslavement, yada yada yada. What's in it for us? The preservation of humanity in the natural order? No, 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 I mean cash. Hebor, it's the end of the world. After that incredibly productive meeting, the party had their next quest, sailing around for literal months in the frigid north. It took a while, but the party had eventually finished their errands and began their trip home. That was until... Hebor, your loved ones have been abducted and thrown into a plane of darkness and death. Abort the quest and hurry back if you wish to help them. Well, it's a little bit too late for that now, huh? The party quickly teleported back to Ace's village in the hopes that they could help but all of them were too late. Villagers were dead all around town, his wife and daughter were definitely missing, and bloodthirsty cultists were stretched out in a conga line through his manor before finally ending near his bedroom. Even after two years, the village was still too weak to protect itself from the raid, and this was the result. Meanwhile, Ace was pretty shocked. Two years worth of hard work led up to this. The village was ruined and the citizens were dead. There wasn't anything else he could do to help. 
Or was there? Now first off, the party was traveling with their new friend Anna, who was a high level cleric. Using divine intervention, she prayed to her god to heal the dead citizens of the town, and instead they were all turned into zombies. Funny story, turns out Anna had a connection to a certain evil dragon goddess, and seeing that the party had recently betrayed her, long story there, Tiamat was the one who decided to answer her prayer. Now all of the villagers were zombies and it would be even harder to resurrect them, so now there really wasn't anything the party could do to help. Or was there? Now, you see, Ace wasn't just helping that angel from earlier for the sake of being a nice guy. He'd not only sold his soul for ungodly amounts of power, the same devil also decided to give Ace a single wish if he could get that angel from earlier off his back. Since the party already purified her, Ace had held his end of the deal and received a wish from the fiend as compensation. Well, guess who's still holding onto that wish after two years? With the power given to him by the literal devil, Ace called upon his wish and asked for things to go back to the way they were. Now, because the rules of wish are so open-ended, and I'm not a big fan of stabbing my players in the back for no reason whatsoever, I created a chart that would determine the odds of having your wish go as planned. Different things like who gave you the wish and who cast it all affect how the spell will turn out. And since a fiend gave Ace his wish, there was a 75% chance it was gonna blow up in his face. Not having any other options though, and really wanting to save his village from its third extinction, yes there were two others, the spell was cast and the following happened. Time stopped. The party could still see and observe the world around them, but neither they nor anyone else could move at all. The party was teleported to the ethereal plane and was forced to watch the village's spectators. The world continued on without them. The village aged 13 years and was now overgrown with vegetation, trees, and wild animals. The party also aged both physically and mentally. Although most of them were blessed by the Holy Sword from earlier to have perfect bodies, the young cleric and the older rogue turned into an adult and an old man respectfully. <laughs> Well, that was anticlimactic. Ow! My back! Bright Clover the Rogue was senile now and refused to go any further with the party until his age was reversed. Luckily enough, Age on the Wizard had his clone spell prepared, which let him create younger copies of people, so he could easily grow another body for Bright Clover's soul to inhabit. Higher level magic is terrifying, but I digress. Problem was, though, the procedure required one cubic inch of Bright Clover's flesh to perform. Since the spell specifically needed his flesh to work, there was no way around it. So rather than, you know, put the man to sleep with magic or potions, he bore straight up smashed a wine bottle over the grandpa's head. Unfortunately, the impact wasn't enough to knock him out as the rogue succeeded his con save, so he tried again with a wooden staff, again to no avail. In the end, they just decided to perform surgery on Bright Clover while he was awake, which funnily enough did less damage to him than he bore did with blunt trauma. The little cubic meat boy was eventually collected, Ajon bought a velvet lined coffin to put the chunk into, sent it over to the rogue's wife for safekeeping, and and it wouldn't be for another four months in game until the coffin fetus was old enough to inhabit. Gosh, this was so weird. So yeah, wish is a pretty volatile spell. The bigger the wish, the higher the chances that things should go horribly wrong, and since Ace at the beginning just wanted to save a bunch of villagers, I didn't have the magic go too crazy, especially considering that a devil was the one casting the spell for him. For any DMs out there wondering what a good way to run wish magic is, it should only be a reward for players who've made heavy sacrifices or completed long or dangerous quests. Even then, you've just given your group the chance to alter reality, and if you're a good DM, won't have all their hard work blow up in their face because of it. Thanks for watching, and once again, today's video was sponsored by the Deck of Many's new Hecna playtest. Hecna itself is a campaign setting for 5e that features a new carnival setting called the Revelia, overseen by the ringleader Hecna, who loves nothing more than to fright and delight carnival goers. Everything you need to play in Revelia is gonna be included in the playtest, along with stat blocks for new, original creatures and magical items. Be sure to check it out today at hecna.com, link in the description.